Okay, welcome. This is the fifth meeting of the 213-214 year of the Foxborough Historical Society. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We don't conduct much business at this meeting because our, our board meetings run for hours. So we only bring the highlights and we have nothing to bring tonight. <laughs> no, uh, we have been working on several things. Uh, the membership growth we're always interested in. We always like it when people bring friends or <coughs> guests to these talks because uh, we think they're terrific and I think it's terrible if we don't fill every seat. So. We have a few extra seats, so if you want to go out and find a friend and bring them in, we'll, we'll sit them right down. Uh, uh, we uh, are working on a purchase of some Civil War historical artifacts. Relates back to a resident of Foxborough who was involved with the 54th Re Regiment uh, during the Civil War, and uh, uh, we uh, have uh, made the purchase and. It will eventually, you'll read about it, and it will be on display at the, uh, hist uh, at the, the old board and library <laughs> called Memorial Hall, <coughs> our, our museum. Uh, at this point in time, uh, I'm going to ask Patrick to step forward and introduce our speaker. And... <coughs> Patrick will give you all the details. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Our speaker tonight, wonderful to see the crowd here. <coughs> Our speaker tonight is uh, Stephen Puglio. Is that correct? That is correct. Wow. Um, he's sitting here in the front row. Um, he is an author, historian, university teacher, and public speaker. He's written a number of books. I'm going to mention two of them. One is uh, The Caning, The Assault That Drove America to Civil War, which is the subject of his talk tonight. And uh, up here, if you're interested after the talk, you can buy the books. The paperback edition is available for $10. Uh, he also wrote uh, Dark Tide, The Great Boston Molasses Flood of 1919, and he talked about that the last time he was here at the Foxborough Historical Society. Um, if you're interested uh, in the details, you can go to stephenpulio.com. There's a lot of good information there, but I want to mention one award that he got that I think is really great. In 2008, he was the recipient of the Outstanding Achievement Award presented by the Appian Club, an Italian-American organization dedicated to preserving and promoting Italian culture in Massachusetts. In 2007, he received the prestigious E. Migliori Award presented by the Pirandello Lyceum to Italian Americans who have excelled in their fields of endeavor and made important contributions to society. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Stephen Polio. Thanks, Pat. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, and thanks for the welcome. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, the mic's on, guys? Excellent, so that's good. We were trying it earlier. We put a new battery in, because it was showing red, now it's showing green, which is a good sign. So thanks for being here, and um, I usually don't get over to Foxborough Center. I usually stop at the stadium. You know, I've been a season ticket holder for the Patriots since, <laughs> since the second Parcells year, so my wife and I have had these tickets, so I come to Foxborough all the time, but don't make it to your beautiful center, which I like when I get over here. And I was just thinking when I pulled up that in a couple of weeks it will be close to light when you're having these 
events at around this time. So that was very encouraging as we get to the end of this winter. So um, tonight I'm going to talk about the caning uh, of Senator Charles Sumner. Um, let me ask you guys, anybody know about the caning? Have you heard about it? Do you know about it? A few hands, a few nods, still excellent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it, a little bit about the making of the book, a little bit about the research, and at the end, open it up to your questions. And when we get to questions, please know that it's really my favorite part of these events is the interaction back and forth with you. So feel free to ask any question you would like about research, writing, books, publishing, the event itself, you know, the caning itself, all fine. So I put just about anything on the table when we get uh, to the Q&A. So I'm going to talk for a little while and then we'll, we'll do questions. Does that sound like a pretty good agenda? Good. Excellent. We'll do it that way then. And um, afterwards, like I said, books for sale. If you want to buy one, great. If you don't want to buy one and want to get on my mailing list, great. If you don't want to do either of those two and want to get a Pulio bookmark, great. So no pressure to do anything. Just enjoy uh, the evening. So tonight, the caning of Senator Charles Sumner. Uh, I kind of position this event that we'll talk about uh, as really the no turning back point on the way to the Civil War. So people will say, well, is it the cause of the Civil War? No, I don't put it in that category. You know, we all know there are several causes, slavery, the most important cause, and there's sectional differences and tariffs and et cetera, et cetera. But what this event was, the beating of Charles Sumner uh, to within an inch of his life on the Senate floor, um, I call it the no turning back point. It's what made Civil War, I think, uh, inevitable, unavoidable. So. Up to this point, there had been these series of compromises on slavery between North and South, you know, fragile truces uh, between the two sides. This kind of destroys all that. It makes compromise impossible. And what is the event that we're talking about? It's a very, very short event. It took about 90 seconds on May 22nd, 1856. Massachusetts Senator uh, Charles Sumner, United States Senator from Massachusetts, was at his desk while the Senate had already adjourned in the Senate chamber in Washington, D.C., when he is beaten to within an inch of his life by Preston Brooks, the congressman from South Carolina. That's the event that we're talking about. Almost everything that happened before it kind of led to it, I think, and almost everything that happened after it, up to the war, five years later, was a re as a result of it. That's kind of how I position uh, this event called the Caney. Uh, when I was doing my research, pretty interesting, uh, two very complex, interesting guys, real life characters, Charles Sumner and Preston Brooks. You take a look at them. Charles Sumner, uh, the senator from Massachusetts, probably the strongest, most unwavering uh, anti-slavery voice in America for a period of about 25 years. Let's say from about 1849, the late 1840s, till he dies in 1874. Uh, staunch anti-slavery, vociferous anti-slavery uh, champion, no doubt about that. Uh, wasn't Lincoln, wasn't Garrison, it was Sumner, no doubt about it. On the flip side, on the flip side, and history is full of flip sides, right? Charles Sumner, not a very likable guy. Uh, he was arrogant, he was condescending, he was imperious, he was impatient. He had some friends, but few friends, and even his good friends could only take him in small doses. <laughs> now, we all have friends like that. Charles <laughs> Sumner was that guy uh, for most of his friends. A humorless, humorless man, uh, almost no relationship with his family. Uh, so not a fun guy to be around. It's an important part of this story because it does come into play during the whole caning episode. But a really interesting character, and most of my research, um, Sumner is a Boston guy, right? He is Harvard educated. He lived on the backside of Beacon Hill on Hancock Street. Um, he is buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. There's a statue to him on the public garden. There's a statue to him at Harvard. And almost all the research, uh, all his papers, uh, are either at the Boston Public Library, at Houghton's, in Harvard, um, at the Mass Historical Society, and Sumner wrote thousands of letters and was the recipient recipient of hundreds of letters many of which came to him after the caning so most of my research for Charles Sumner took place in this in this area in the Boston area for Preston Brooks um, another really interesting guy 
Uh, I was really privileged to be able to go down to South Carolina to do my research on him. He was the congressman from the Edgefield District of South Carolina. And just to get your geography straight, it is on the western part of South Carolina, about 30 minutes from Augusta, Georgia, for you Masters fans. 30 minutes away is Edgefield, South Carolina, one of the most pro-slavery regions from probably the staunchest pro-slavery state, South Carolina, uh, a very influential region, Edgefield. Preston Brooks was the congressman there, uh, starts his career off as a moderate, quite different than Charles Sumner, uh, starts his career off as a moderate. In fact, many of his constituents thought he was a little too moderate on the subject of slavery and on relationships with the North. The North, uh, Northern congressmen would, would often go to Brooks to broker deals in the Congress because he had this kind of reputation of working between North and South. It's not until after the Kansas-Nebraska Act, around 1855, that uh, Preston Brooks becomes a real fire eater, a staunch pro-slavery congressman. Um, kind of also on the flip side, he actually is a pretty nice guy. Lots of friends, very conversational. People like being around him. Strong family man, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of interesting from that point of view, too. So when I went to South Carolina, I did my research first in Columbia at University of South Carolina, USC, as they call themselves, the other USC. That's what they call themselves in Columbia, um, where there's lots of Brooks papers. He wasn't as prolific as Sumner, but did write a great deal and received hundreds of letters himself after the caning. Much different tone of those letter, to those letters that we'll talk about, but they're all in those Brooks papers. And then when I got to um, Edgefield, I got to see the two private homes that Brooks lived in. They're now privately owned. The people were great. They sort of opened their homes up and toured me around. And uh, he's buried at the Edgefield Cemetery. <clears throat> I spent some time at the Edgefield Town Grill which is owned by the Edgefield County historian, <coughs> great guy, and a Harvard graduate who settled back in South Carolina. Very familiar with Sumner, kind of knows the whole Harvard piece of that. Really, really interesting guy. And I, I said to my wife when I got back, the, among the most interesting parts of my visit to South Carolina <coughs> when I went to Edgefield was the research itself, sure, uh, was not the fact that there was wonderful southern hospitality, which there was, not the fact that they made fun of my Boston accent, which they did. Um, but I had my, what, what the real highlight was, I had my first meal of shrimp and grits at the Edgefield Town Grill. <clears throat> I have never had those before. They were fabulous. And I said to the owner, who's this historian, the Harvard graduate, I said, Bettis, you cannot get good shrimp and grits up north. You just can't. And he says, I know, but you can't get good Chinese down here. That was, our, that was our little back and forth, you know, north and south, back and forth. He said, man, I used to love the Chinese food when I went to Harvard. So we kind of had a nice little uh, joke and laugh about that. So interesting part in terms of both of these characters are very, very complex guys. And we'll talk uh, a little bit more about it. The other, I don't know, the other profound moment during the research uh, was this. When you look at what people say about Congress today, the country today, you hear a lot of talk about how partisan things are and how you know, profound differences that we have. And, and this, is this the most partisan we've ever been and the most divided we've ever been? You know, when you're in the moment, when you're in the moment, it's always, is this the worst? Is this the best? Is this the biggest? Is this the most, right? When you're in the moment. Is this the worst the weather has ever been? No. Is this the worst the economy has ever been? No, 1935 wasn't that, that, that good either, um, right? So there's all that. Well, this we always talk about, is this the most partisan we've ever been? And the answer, of course, is no. Um, the 1850s, I think, by far the most partisan uh, decade in American history, the most divided decade in American history, the run-up to the Civil War. I don't think there's any, any doubt about it. And when you, think about, when you think about the issues that we are debating today versus the main issue they were debating then, think about it. So the issues we debate today, and they're important, and I don't mean to minimize them in any way, shape, or form, but the issues we debate today are issues like, who should pay taxes? How much should they pay? How do we fund health care? 
Is it a good thing or a bad thing to have this kind of, you know, uh, national kind of health care? What do we do about illegal immigration? Those are the issues we talk about today. All important. But when you think about what was the debate on the congressional floors of the House and the Senate during the 1850s, they were questions like this. Should one man be able to own another? Right? Should one man be able to sell another? Should one man be able to sell a husband to one owner, his wife to a second owner, and yes, their children to a third owner, a completely separate owner, maybe from a different state? Are blacks people or are they property? So those are the kinds of debates that are taking place on the floor of the House and the Senate in the 1850s. And as I'm doing the research, I'm thinking to myself, the issues we're dealing with today I don't know, they seem much more manageable after I read some of those great debates. And they were powerful debates during the 1850s. So I kind of got, I don't know, a little bit of optimism, thinking to myself, we ought to be able to, you know, get a little closer on things here today compared to what was happening in the 1850s. So thought about that during this research as well. And when I, when I tell this story, when we get to the caning, I think you have to kind of start with that decade and say, what made the 1850s different? What made the 1850s so polarizing, so partisan? What was the change? America had been compromising on the issue of slavery literally since her founding. Thomas Jefferson's original draft of the Declaration of Independence contains anti-slavery language that got taken out during the debates, the Continental Congress debates about the Declaration. In 1787, during the constitutional debates for this new nation, right, during the summer in Philadelphia, steaming hot summer during the Constitutional Convention, lots of debate about slavery in that three-month period. Lots of debate. But at the end, the document comes out on September 17th, right, with nothing about slavery. Nothing. Why? Because big concerns that if there was anti-slavery language, if there was anti-slavery language in the Constitution, then maybe the Virginians would not ratify, the South Carolinians would not ratify, the Georgians would not ratify, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And maybe there would be no Constitution. Many of the founders, northern founders, thought slavery would die its own death, you know, within 10 to 20 years. And so the compromise they made was, okay, we'll keep it out of the document. It will eventually die, it won't be economically viable, and it will be gone. And so we'll get this thing ratified, we'll get this thing through. Now, Eli Whitney and the cotton gin changes all of that in 1823. Great technological improvement that also turns slavery into an enormous business. So keep that in mind. And then early in the 1800s, lots of little compromises on slavery. And in, the, in 1820 comes the big, giant compromise on slavery, a convoluted compromise, as many of the compromises on slavery were, the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Now, I'll be talking about a few things today that most of us would go home when we were kids to our parents and say, why do we need to know this, the Missouri Compromise, you know? But it's this unbelievably great compromise that Congress comes up with to keep that fragile truce on slavery. What do they say? They say everything south of that very famous 3630 parallel, slavery would be permitted. Everything north of it, slavery would be prohibited, except in one state, Missouri, which is almost totally north of the 3630 parallel. So that's part of the weird, weird uh, compromise. And oh, let's do one other thing to kind of balance things off. Let's take a big, large chunk of the state of Massachusetts and create a brand new free state that we will call Maine. Yes, so that's the Compromise of 1820. Very strange. There's a lot of different pieces to it. Those are the big elements of it in 1820. In the 30s and in the 1840s, the great Compromise Senators keep a lid on things. John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, Henry Clay from Kentucky, the great compromiser, and from Massachusetts, Daniel Webster, 
those three kind of worked together in a powerful Senate at the time, even more powerful than the presidency at the time. They work on compromises on slavery. And then comes the 1850s, the decade of the 1850s, and the change happens. Something happens to change the game, to make compromise oh so much more difficult. And I believe there are two things that happen. The first, the first is a major convoluted compromise that takes place in 1850, called, simply enough, the Compromise of 1850. I love the nice simple language. Um, and the Compromise of 1850, architected by Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, the Compromise of 1850 has many different components. But the most important component comes about as a result of a very strange connection. History is full of strange connections. Things happen for reasons that you sometimes don't get. This strange connection was the discovery of gold in California. In late 1848, gold is discovered in California. Thousands of people make their way west as part of the gold rush. California is populated so quickly that it almost skips the territory stage and applies for statehood almost immediately. Late 1849, they're applying for statehood. Only one problem at the time. There are 30 states in the Union. 15 of them are free. 15 of them are slave. California is applying for admission to the Union as a free state. That is going to disrupt things. It's going to make it 16 to 15. The South, very, very concerned about this. Concerned because not only will California's admittance as a free state alter the balance of power in the halls of Congress, it could also hurt the momentum for the future of slavery. And so they demand something in return. What they demand in return is part of the Compromise of 1850, and what that is is a very strict, stringent, fugitive slave law. And the fugitive slave law that Daniel Webster comes up with basically says this, normally up to this point, if slaves escaped from the South, made their way North, they were free. Free men, free women if they were women. There were a few women, mostly they were men. They were free once they reached freedom, free states or Canada. The Fugitive Slave Law now said this, if a slave runs away from a slave holder, from a slave owner, makes his way north, and the owner sends slave hunters to hunt that escapee, which they almost always did, particularly for young men between the ages of about 19 and 25, the most valuable of the slaves. If those slave hunters came at hunting north, then it was up to the police departments, the sheriffs, the marshals, and the court systems in those northern municipalities or jurisdictions to assist in their return to bondage. That was part of it. Very, very important piece of it. Fugitive slave law. And it manifests itself, it comes to a head in Boston in April of 1851 when Boston sends her first fugitive slave back to bondage, Thomas Sims, in April of 1851. Now the Boston abolitionist community was appalled and outraged and humiliated, humiliated that Sims, who had escaped from Georgia, came here was caught on the streets in downtown Boston by slave hunters. Boston police assisted in his arrest. The court system uh, helped process him, and they sent him back uh, on a ship to Georgia, to Savannah, Georgia. Abolitionist community more outraged, more appalled, more angry when they find out that Sims received 39 lashes on his bare back, which was the, which was the punishment for running away in the square, in the town square of Savannah. Now, big concerns here with the abolitionist community in Boston. The Boston abolitionist community, one of the most vociferous abolitionist communities and influential abolitionist communities, spoke out about this, um, made much noise about this across the North. The abolitionist communities, the very strong ones in New York and Rhode Island and Pennsylvania and Ohio, got word of Sims, were also kind of victims to the fugitive slave laws themselves the abolitionist communities rise up as a result 
of the fugitive slave law. And in Boston, in Boston, it manifests itself in very particular ways. Up to this point, up to Sims, the abolitionist community in Boston, though loud, though vociferous, though influential, was largely a movement of making speeches and writing. Some of the more militant members of the abolitionist community, like Thomas Wentworth Higginson, were upset at people like Garrison because they thought Garrison was really in it for the show. He was in it for the cause, but didn't really like to get his hands dirty. After Sims has set back, sent back to Georgia, the Boston abolitionist community becomes quite militant and over the next 10 years helps about 300 runaway slaves escape to northern New Hampshire and Vermont and to Canada. And they do it in very tangible ways. They do it with money, they do it with food, they do it with transportation, they do it with alibis, they do it with hiding places, you name it. They take a much more militant stance, as do abolitionist communities in the North. They become much more militant in assisting slaves as part of that runaway, as a direct result of the Fugitive Slave Law. Number two, the other impact, big impact of the Fugitive Slave Law is this. Most people in Massachusetts at that time, most people across the North at that time, were not members of the abolitionist community. In Massachusetts, most were moderates, some conservatives. Abolitionists were viewed as fringe types, even here. Uh, many business people in Massachusetts, not very far from where we are today, textile people, made millions of dollars, right? Using as their raw material, what? cotton from the South picked by slaves. There was a very nice symbiotic relationship between many of the business people in Massachusetts and Southern slave owners. Now there might have been feelings among some of these moderates that they weren't big fans of sl slavery, that maybe they didn't want to see slavery expand, that kind of thing, but as far as abolition, just completely abolishing it, not really part of their lexicon. The Fugitive Slave Law, the Fugitive Slave Law makes these people, this large group of people, very, very uneasy. They are not happy about sending runaway slaves back to slavery. It has a profound impact on the non-abolitionists in the North. And I think maybe that's even more important than the impact that it has on the North. So, the Fugitive Slave Law, think about that. And the Fugitive Slave Law does one more thing in Massachusetts that has widespread implications. <clears throat> Shortly after Thomas Sims is sent back, the Massachusetts legislature votes on who the new United States Senator from Massachusetts is going to be to replace Daniel Webster, who goes on to become Secretary of State. Now you'll remember, uh, uh, senators were not directly elected by the people then, not till 1913 does that happen. Legislatures elected the senators. And so who emerges as the dark horse favorite and becomes senator from Massachusetts on the 26th ballot after an incredibly contentious ballot and process behind closed doors? Charles Sumner of Massachusetts emerges. Some of the favorites drop out, Sumner comes up from nowhere, and on the 26th ballot is elected senator. As a couple of abolitionists said, his election was almost as a direct result of the Sims case, of Sims being sent back. South sees that, gets a little antsy about somebody as radical as Charles Sumner being, being named to the United States Senate. So that all happens as a result of the Fugitive Slave Law. Daniel Webster, when the Fugitive Slave Law was passed, said, the Union stands firm. One of the great political miscalculations in all of history, all of American history for sure, Daniel Webster's comment, the Union stands firm. The second big event that happens in the 1850 that I think changes the game is the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Another one of those things, you wondered, do I need to know this? So the Kansas-Nebraska Act, architected, believe it or not, by another northerner, Stephen Douglas, senator from Illinois. You know about him from the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Yes, so Stephen Douglas has an idea. When the territories of Nebraska and Kansas are thinking about applying for statehood to the Union, 
Douglas says, let's put that Missouri compromise aside for now. How about this? How about for these new territories? <clears throat> we propose something called popular sovereignty. Fancy name for? How about the people from those territories vote on whether they want slavery or not when they come into the Union? Now in Nebraska, not a real big deal. It's a little too far north for slavery to be economically viable. But in Kansas, slavery would be very viable in Kansas. And Douglas puts this forward much to the North's chagrin and much to the South's delight. Kansas, Nebraska of 1854. Now, why would Stephen Douglas do that? Very, very political reasons. Number one, he had his designs on the presidency and believed he would need Southern Democrats to support him. I think he's probably right about that. And number two, as early as 1854, there was lots of talk about a transcontinental railroad going across the country. Doesn't happen for another 12 years or so. Um, but Stephen Douglas wanted the eastern terminus of that railroad to be in his home state, Chicago. The South, most of the South wanted the eastern terminus to be in St. Louis, Missouri. So Douglas kind of puts forth this Kansas-Nebraska compromise. Southerners are thrilled because they believe they can send enough people to Kansas, quite literally, to stuff the ballot box, to influence the voting. That's, their, that's their, uh, what they're excited about as a result of Kansas-Nebraska. In the North, Douglas terribly miscalculates the reaction. There are howls of protest in the North, rallies across the North, Stephen Douglas is burned in effigy in many rallies across the North. In fact, Douglas himself said he believed he could find his own way home from Washington to his home in Illinois at night by the light of his own burning effigies. <laughs> that today would be called low favorability ratings, right? <laughs> Stephen Douglas, a very self-aware guy, self-aware guy actually made that comment in the midst of Kansas, Nebraska. The South, by the way, begins to send people to Kansas. Ladies in Alabama and Mississippi sold jewelry to finance trips to Kansas. The state of South Carolina gave $200 to anybody who would want to take that trek west to Kansas. People from Missouri, they call them border ruffians, slave owners and supporters, pro-slavery supporters from Missouri, came across the border, poured into Kansas. And, so, and the North responds by, by sending hundreds and hundreds and into the thousands of anti-slavery abolitionists to Kansas. And Kansas becomes a place of mayhem. Murder, riots, um, property destruction, Lawrence is sacked, Topeka is sacked. Uh, and it becomes the center of the slavery debate in the United States. <clears throat> right into 1855 and early 1856. The center of debate for slavery is not Massachusetts, not South Carolina, not Washington, D.C., it is Kansas. And the anti-slavery folks in Kansas give it the name Bleeding Kansas. That's the name, that's the term they used for all of the destruction that the pro-slavery uh, forces were causing. Now, I love this idea of stuffing the ballot box, and there was a series of elections in Kansas, and my favorite my favorite is one in which pro-slavery people flooded this region and there were 1,500 registered voters and 6,000 ballots cast. <laughs> My favorite story of all of them, uh, and there are many of those kinds of stories uh, in Kansas at the time. But at any rate, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts is apoplectic about what's going on in Kansas, <coughs> furious about what's going on in Kansas, wants to give a major speech on the floor of the Senate. And the leadership doesn't give him the floor in January and February and March. People are writing him letters from Kansas. My dear sir, help us. Help us. Hannah Ropes writes from Kansas. You can't believe how bad things are here. And finally, leadership says to Sumner, you can give a speech in May. You can have the floor in May to deliver your speech about Kansas. Charles Sumner practices this speech, works on this speech for weeks prior to. Um, commits it to memory, and on May 19th, 1856, stands up in the Senate chamber and begins to give a five-hour speech on Kansas. 
Three hours on May 19th, two hours on May 20th, the speech would be called The Crime Against Kansas. Very, very famous speech in American history, the speech that sparks this event that we're talking about. Now, it is great theater in the Senate chamber. The ch Senate chamber is jammed to overflowing. Even the ladies' galleries are filled to capacity, wrote one New York reporter, which almost never happened in the Senate chamber. Why? Because Charles Sumner was a very good orator and because Charles Sumner was very unpredictable as to what he would say. He was very, very unpredictable. He would think nothing of personal insults in his speech, invective in his speech, and so there was this great anticipation. What will Sumner say when he talks about the crime against Kansas? And had Charles Sumner stood up and just talked about slavery in Kansas, we might not be here today talking about this subject. Who knows what would have happened in American history? Really hard to say. <clears throat> but Sumner really can't help himself. Spends a lot of time on the issues in Kansas. And then decides to hurl some personal insults in his speech. And he chooses as the target of his speech United States Senator from South Carolina, Andrew Butler. Now, Andrew Butler, kind of a quintessential slaveholder, shock of white hair, owned many, many slaves, very pro-slavery guy. Not in the chamber during this speech because he's home recovering from a stroke and the stroke left his face partially paralyzed. Made it very, very difficult for him to talk. He kind of tended to spit while he talked. Charles Sumner makes fun of this affliction in this speech. Makes fun of Butler's uh, affliction in his stroke, in his speech. And the other thing he says, the other thing Sumner says, is that Andrew Butler, Senator from South Carolina, Andrew Butler has a mistress, a mistress who is ugly and polluted to most of us, but lovely and chaste in his eyes. I am talking about the harlot slavery. So he uses this image of a prostitute slavery and being Andrew Butler's mistress at the time. Now, there, there are howls of outrage <clears throat> right after the speech and even during the speech from the South. And even many Northerners very upset that Charles Sumner took this tack, adopted this language, went after Butler personally. Stephen Douglas, by the way, back of the chamber at the time, said, that damn fool is going to get himself killed by another damn fool. <laughs> lots, of, lots of people in the North, Northern Senators, not happy that Sumner was kind of pouring some gasoline on this tinderbox. The South, furious at Sumner to pick on uh, Butler, who wasn't there, <clears throat> to pick on his stroke, to pick on this mistress that he called slavery, use that imagery, that evocative imagery. They were furious. And one man was more furious than the rest, Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina, because not only was Preston Brooks from the same state as Andrew Butler, he was Andrew Butler's second cousin. He was kin. He was a relative. And under the Southern Code of Honor by which he was bound, Preston Brooks felt he needed to avenge Andrew Butler's honor and do something to Charles Sumner. <clears throat> so he meets with his colleagues the night, first night of the speech and the second night of the speech, and they come up with a variety of different possibilities of what Brooks could do. Possibility number one, how about challenging Sumner to a duel? Very common way of settling differences at the time. And they decide no because duels, duels were only for gentlemen to settle their differences. And Charles Sumner did not rise to the level of a gentleman. That was the discussion between Brooks and his colleagues. So that was ruled out. Brooks says, what about if I just literally call him out and we settle it with our fists, fisticuffs, like men, one on one? And his colleagues say, no, Charles Sumner is a very arrogant man. There's no way he'll come outside to meet you. He will simply demand that you meet him at his desk. So they rule that out. But there are various kinds of discussions that they're having. So finally, Preston Brooks comes up with what he's going to do. And on the morning of May 22nd, he takes his wooden gutta percha cane, which has a gold knob, and he walks outside the Capitol, sits down to where the area that Charles Sumner normally walks in, hoping to meet Sumner early in the day. And they miss connections. They miss connections. Sumner goes in another way. And so shortly after lunchtime on that day, May 22nd, the House has adjourned 
and the Senate has adjourned. Preston Brooks makes his way over to the Senate. There's about 35 people milling around the Senate chamber. Some senators, some newspaper men, some staff people. And Charles Sumner is at his desk at the front of the Senate chamber, head down, signing copies, franking copies of his Crime Against Kansas speech, which he had already printed previously. Picked him up at the printer, was signing copies to send to his constituents. Very common practice uh, of the day. Totally oblivious to what's going on in the Senate chamber. Brooks walks in with two of his colleagues, goes down the aisle, and sits down with his cane. Now, why does he sit down? Because there's a lady present in the chamber, one woman, talking to the sergeant of arms. And Brooks says, I knew I couldn't do what I came to do in the presence of a lady. She stays for about 10 minutes, talks to the sergeant of arms, leaves. <clears throat> Preston Brooks walks up. Now, Charles Sumner is at a desk that's bolted to the floor. You know, just one of those old-fashioned desks. He's under it. His chair has wheels on it. His legs are kind of pinioned under the desk. He's a big guy. He's a little over six feet tall. Head bowed, signing those speeches. Preston Brooks walks up to him with his cane, raises his cane, and says, Mr. Sumner, I have read your speech over twice. It is a libel against my state and my relative. With that, Sumner's looking up. And Brooks comes down on top of Sumner's head with the cane as hard as he can. Bang. Sumner's head explodes in blood, just immediately explodes in blood, just the way the cane hits. And Preston Brooks loses it and begins to beat Sumner again and again. Sumner is trying to get loose. He kind of forgets his chairs on wheels, and he's just trying to move. He can't move, and he finally, with this mighty lunge, literally tears the desk from its moorings and stumbles over. Brooks continues to beat him again and again, holds him up by the lapel. One person, a New York uh, newspaper man, begins to go to Sumner to help, and he is, he is held back by, by Brooks's colleagues who say, let them go, let them go. Nobody else goes to Sumner's aid. Brooks continues to beat him. He says later, I gave him 30 first-rate stripes. Every one of them went exactly where I intended, and at the end, he was bellowing like a calf. He beats Sumner until his cane shatters, shatters in, in 100 pieces. And he has the gold knob left. Sumner is in a pool of his own blood when finally one of his, uh, Brooks's uh, colleagues comes and grabs him by the arm and says, stop, do not kill him. And Charles Sumner is unconscious in that pool of his own blood. And they leave the chamber. Charles Sumner's colleagues then come to him, bring him into a little ante room where they clean his wounds, he regains consciousness briefly. They take him to his home, to his lodgings in Washington, D.C., not far from the Capitol. And he is visited by a doctor who stitches him, stitches his, his scalp, his head, uh, to the best of his ability. And just before he loses consciousness again, Charles Sumner says, I never thought such a thing was possible. And he loses consciousness again. The next day, the next day, news of the caning goes th across the United States of America like a brush fire. There were 3,000 newspapers in the U.S. at the time. Almost everyone reads one, north and south. That's where they get their news. Telegraph, invented 12 years earlier, makes all this possible. And news about the caning goes across the country. Amazing kinds of responses in the north. In the north, there is outrage at the beating. Outrage that Sumner was beaten so badly um, even people who weren't Sumner supporters, and there were many who were not, believed this was a free speech issue, believed that no matter what Sumner said, as provocative as it might have been, that nothing warranted that kind of a beating. And so reactions across the North, newspapers, average citizens, senators and congressmen, you name it, across the North, condemned Preston Brooks. Across the South, very, very different complete polar opposite reaction. Preston Brooks was lionized as a hero. Almost, almost, not totally, but almost every Southern newspaper editorialized uh, that he had done the right thing. He received hundreds of canes as gifts from well-wishers across the South, many of them inscribed with the words, hit him again, <laughs> hit him again. The lead editorial in the Edgefield Advertiser, the title 
of that editorial was hit him again. General tone was, these abolitionists have gone far enough. They have talked about destroying our way of life for years. They have demanded uncompensated abolition for years. And uncompensated was a big, big word in the South. They don't even want to pay us for our slaves, for our property. And it's about time they had, they had what was coming to them. That was the general tone of the Southern reaction to the beating. Almost immediately, there are repercussions from the Cayman. The very next day, an abolitionist by the name of John Brown, right? You know John Brown. John Brown in Kansas at the time, fighting the abolitionist battle against pro-slavery forces in Kansas, reads, <coughs> reads about Sumner's beating, and according to his son, John Brown's son, goes crazy. John Brown and his sons and a few other uh, men in his group commit five gruesome, savage murders in Pottawatomie, Kansas. Um, I, I talk about them in the book. They're, they're fairly gruesome. They pull out uh, pro-slavery men in the middle of the night from their homes. And, you know, there's, there's um, amputations and there's, they use axes and they use hatchets and that kind of stuff. John Brown goes crazy. John Brown, the mad abolitionist, comes about at that moment in Kansas as a direct result of the caning. In the South, in the South, John Brown's actions, again, are condemned. They're shocked in the South. Not only, not only are abolitionists, they say, people who want to destroy our way of life, they are now cold-blooded murderers. So big change, big gulf starts to widen. Later, in the spring, in the summer, in the fall of 1856, something even more profound starts to happen. Thousands and thousands of moderate Northerners begin to enroll in the newly formed anti-slavery Republican Party. Big, big, big numbers as a direct result of the Caney. The Republican Party's membership swells. This is a party that was only 18 months old, and in some states only nine months old in the summer of 1856. Yet, yet, when they put their first candidate up for president in 1856, John C. Fremont, they put him up for president, he almost wins. He doesn't. He loses to James Buchanan, but he almost wins. And he almost wins without a single southern electoral vote. He loses a few northern states, but the South sees very early. They see in 1856 that a president of the United States could be elected with a united North without a single southern electoral vote, which, by the way, is exactly what happens in 1860 with a man named Abraham Lincoln. The South sees that. A harbinger of that is happening in 1856. It's pretty amazing as these people are joining the Republican Party. Um, poor Charles Sumner, who's out of the Senate for over three years as a result of his beating. During the summer and fall of 1856, he's trying to get back to work, but he can't. He's got, he's got brain trauma, he's got neck trauma, he's got spinal injuries, he's got back trauma, all of that. Um, he's trying to get back to work, and his allies, the Republican anti-slavery allies, Keep urging him not to hurry. Why? Because your vacant chair speaks even more eloquently than you. It's a wonderful political symbol to have Charles Sumner's vacant chair. Wonderful in terms of enrolling new members to the party. And it was kind of heart-wrenching. You'd see these letters from Sumner, you know, during this period, during that three or four months right after. And Sumner would be writing these very earnest, plaintive letters saying, Oh, I long to get back to work. There is so much I want to say. The debate is so important. And almost every single letter he receives back from his allies, his anti-slavery Republican allies, say essentially the tone is, you know what, don't rush, Charles. Make sure you're totally better uh, before you come back. They don't want him to come back right away because of the recruitment power of his vacant chair. So that happens even past the 1856 election into 1857. The Republican Party swells with membership uh, in this anti-slavery crusade. Many of the moderates in the North begin joining 
the Republican Party. Important point to make. And in 1857, in early 1857, one of the most remarkable episodes of this entire story occurs. Late January, 37-year-old Congressman Preston Brooks in Washington, D.C. at the time, dies suddenly of a throat infection, totally unexpectedly, dies of a throat infection. There's a huge funeral in D.C., ceremonial kind of funeral. President attends. Northern, southern congressmen, senators attend. Big, big, big hoopla. And even more remarkably than that, 26 men from Edgefield, South Carolina, make the trek to D.C. to bring Preston Brooks' body back to Edgefield. And they bring it back by boat and by horseback and by stagecoach. And on the way, thousands and thousands of, of Southerners turn out to watch and to pay homage to the body as it goes through these towns on its way back to Edgefield. The North is aghast at this kind of hero's funeral that Brooks receives. And the South's reaction really, really made a difference here. Had the South condemned Brooks, Northerners would have been able to say, this is one Southern congressman, hot-headed congressman, who lost his temper. But because of the Southern response, the North had nowhere to go with that. They were beginning to believe that maybe compromise was totally out of the question. That gulf was getting wider and wider. Make no mistake about this, Preston Brooks. Preston Brooks, in that seven, eight month period between May 22nd of 1856, when he came Charles Sumner, and January 28th, 1857, when he died, was as big in the South as John C. Calhoun was before him and as Robert E. Lee was after him. Now, he doesn't have the historical staying power of either of those two gentlemen. But in the moment, in, the, in that moment in history, he was huge across the South. Very important to keep in mind. In March of 1857, the southern-leaning United States Supreme Court, led by Preston Brooks's friend, Chief Justice Roger Taney, uh, issues one of the most controversial and, uh, and I guess, terrible decisions uh, in Supreme Court history, the Dred Scott decision, Dred Scott case. Again, an extremely convoluted decision. The big aspects of that, number one, that blacks were not people but property, therefore they couldn't become citizens. And number two, forget all this Missouri Compromise, forget all this Kansas-Nebraska, Congress shall make no law preventing slavery in any state. It's up to the states to do that. Congress had no authority to do that. As Stephen Douglas said, according to this decision, I could wake up in Illinois, could be a slave state. Roger Taney, friends of Brooks, Roger Taney, who was a very, very staunch Southerner, pro-slavery Southerner, I believe saw his world crumbling and had a very personal tragedy just a couple months earlier when his wife and daughter died the same day from yellow fever. I believe his whole world, everything he cared about was crumbling and the Dred Scott case was a direct outgrowth, his writing in that case, a direct outgrowth of the environment that occurred because of the caning and what was happening between North and South. In 1858, Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln engage in the classic debates, right? The Lincoln-Douglas debates. We hear that a lot today. Three-hour debates seven times across the state of Illinois for the Senate ship of Illinois. Tens of thousands of people turn out for these debates. In pouring rain, in blistering sun, several times at every debate, Abraham Lincoln mentions the caning and mentions Preston Brooks, now deceased Preston Brooks and says, if the South is made up of people, if the slaveholder power is made up of people like Brooks, then perhaps compromise is not possible. Big, big issue. In 1859, John Brown makes his way from Kansas to Massachusetts, on the lamb still for the murders that he committed back in 1856, makes his way to Massachusetts, where he meets with Massachusetts abolitionists, he is looking to raise $30,000, which he does here, because he wants, to, he wants to raid the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, now West Virginia, but Virginia, to spark a slave insurrection, a slave uprising. Raises the money here before he leaves to go south. He meets with 
Charles Sumner. Sumner says in his quarters, would you like to see the jacket I was wearing when I was beaten? It still has the blood on it. John Brown says, yes, I would. They go to the closet. Brown touches, touches the jacket, sees the blood stains, and says later, I felt as though I was touching the hem of the garment of a martyr. A lot of martyr talk as part of this whole, of this whole episode. John Brown, of course, goes south. His raid fails miserably. He is hanged in December of 1859. Becomes somewhat of a martyr himself up north. Not universally, but in a big way up north. 1860, what the South fears the most happens. Abraham Lincoln is elected president with a unified north. And about two and a half weeks later, the South begins to secede, led by South Carolina first and then the rest, and then the attack on Fort Sumter in April. My book ends with the beginning of the Civil War and that five-year period, that unbelievably volatile five-year period uh, in between. A couple of other points, and then I'll open up to your questions. Charles Sumner. What happens to Sumner? So here's Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner is uh, out of the Senate for about three years. Terrible pain most of that time. Uh, I believe he has lots of physical pain. I believe he also has some post-traumatic stress syndrome because every time he tried to get close, every time he got close to Washington, his pain increased. Very, very profoundly it increased. He went to Europe to try to get better. During his convalescence, he hooks up with a French surgeon who has this great idea, brand new treatment, on how to alleviate pressure on one's spine. And that was by rubbing an open flame across the bare back. <laughs> that would loosen the pressure, that heat would loosen the pressure. Charles Sumner undergoes what he calls fire treatments six or seven times in France and again writes these letters back saying, um, yes, there are boils and superations on my back, but I feel as though I'm getting better. And there was a couple of periods during this time when the South accused Sumner of faking and I always thought that couldn't be true. Nobody would put themselves through these treatments um, if they were faking. So he finally comes back to the Senate in January of 1860, makes a speech in June of 1860, an anti-slavery speech in June of 1860 called The Barbarism of Slavery, another famous speech. And it is the last, appropriately enough I think, the last major anti-slavery speech in United States history in Congress. There are no major speeches in Congress in the summer of 1860, and then Lincoln is elected and then the South secedes, and then the war happens, and then, of course, slavery ends after. Sumner makes the last big anti-slavery speech, essentially, <clears throat> in American history. Sumner uh, is very active after the war in Reconstruction. He is not of the Lincoln um, malice toward none charity for all school. Uh, he's very harsh Reconstructionist, believes the South should pay. If it's possible, I think the South hated Sumner between the years 1866 and 1870 more than they hated him before the war. Um, he is very, very active in the three great Reconstruction Amendment passages. The 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment, which says that the children of slaves born here are citizens. And the 15th Amendment, which gives black men the right to vote. Some are very active in all of that. He dies in 1874, so 18 years after the caning. And when he does die, his body is, lies in state, at the State House in Boston. 50,000 people go by, file past. Uh, amazing number of people for a senator. Uh, the Reconstruction government of South Carolina in place at the time lowers their flag in Columbia to half staff in his honor, which was probably not something most of the South Carolinians would be in favor of, but the Reconstruction government did so, and he's buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. Two other points, and then I will turn it over to your questions. First one, people say to me, would the Civil War have happened without the Caney? What if there had been no Caney? You still think the Civil War would have happened? And I say this, I say, of course there's no way to know, but, but I do think I do think it would not have happened as quickly, even though it was five years. Those dominoes began to fall very, very quickly. And despite the fugitive slave law and despite Kansas, Nebraska, there might have been room for compromise. Delay can produce compromise. Who knows what would have happened? 
Some people think slavery would have died its own death in about the mid-1880s or early 1890s, either through new technologies, through synthetic fibers that would make um, cotton almost obsolete as a business, those kinds of things. I think there's some merit to that. Um, so that's my answer, that I think it wouldn't have happened as quickly, and perhaps there could have been compromise. So that's that answer. And my last point. The other thing this research told me is that almost every single stereotype that we use today, that Southerners use of Northerners today, and that Northerners use of Southerners today, can be traced back not only to the 1850s, but almost to this incident. It was really kind of fascinating to me. So our Northern stereotypes that Southerners are rednecks and goobers, and you name them today, almost is exactly the kind of language, exactly, that Charles Sumner's supporters were saying about Preston Brooks and other members of the slave power. And the southern stereotype today of northerners, and dare I say people from the northeast, and dare I say sorry, people from Massachusetts, that they are rude, condescending, arrogant, and impatient. Almost exactly the same language that Preston Brooks's supporters were using of Sumner and his supporters at the time. So I always think, you know, if you know where stereotypes come from, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll overcome them, but at least you can kind of manage them and understand them and, and kind of get it. So I think that was pretty fascinating as part of the research. So I, as almost everything in history, attaining enormous implications, I think, 150 years ago, still some pretty big implications with us today. So thank you very much. I'm going to take a drink of water. And Take your questions, and if I can hear them, I'll repeat them so you don't have to strain. Yes, sir, go first, because you had hit it. I think you answer the question, but is it true that as a congressman, Brooks only read the speech, he wouldn't have been in the Senate unless it was a joint session or something? So, the question was, was Brooks in the Senate for the speech? Um, and he was for part of it. Part of it on day one, he was there. Um, as I said, three hours on day one, two hours on the second day. And then he did read it afterwards, twice, as he said. Uh, and he testifies as that, uh, about that later. So yes, he does. He was there for a while, and then he does read it. Yep. Yes, sir. You mentioned that Charles Sumner was six feet tall, pretty uh, good-sized guy. How about uh, Brooks? Yeah, Brooks, maybe, from what you could see, I think it's about 5'7", you know, right in that, right in that area. So if they duped uh, it out as they had proposed the possibility of the solution, it probably would have gone some of this way. One of, the, one of the issues that Brooks does cite, um, he's concerned about that, yeah. that Sumner would do that. And, and there was lots of talk, by the way, also, of Brooks, should he bring a gun into the chamber? And he said no, because he didn't want to do something he'd regret for the rest of his life, which, which, was, which was shoot and kill Charles Sumner. He was very adamant, by the way, that his intention was not to kill Sumner, but to teach him a lesson. I think he essentially loses it when he sees that first blood. There's like a bloodlust there that just, you know, at that point. But no, there's lots of debate about, and he even says afterwards in letters that he's written, that's why I left my sidearms home, or back at the, you know, back at the uh, house. Um, but he doesn't bring them into the Senate. So, and it was not uncommon for those guys to carry sidearms into the, you know, into the chambers. So he leaves them kind of interesting, yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, curious. Wasn't there any uh, assault and battery laws? Yes. So the question is, was there any assault and battery laws uh, that uh, Brooks would have been subjected to? And I will tell you, thank you for the question. When I do these presentations, I can't include everything in the presentation, so I hope I'll get a question that will bring that up. And so thanks. And you're not a plant, right? You did, we, didn't discuss this. <laughs> we didn't discuss this beforehand. Yes. So Brooks is uh, charged with assault. You are right. Exactly assault. His sentence is a $500 fine. You know, not a... Not an insignificant amount at the time. Um, his southern colleagues raised the money for him on his behalf. He didn't need them to. He was wealthy. Uh, but they do as, as kind of a symbolic gesture. And then there are expulsion hearings in the House. Uh, wonderful debate in these expulsion hearings. And you needed a two-thirds vote to expel. They don't get a two-thirds vote. They get a majority vote to expel. Preston Brooks, a very proud guy resigns his seat as a result of the majority vote to expel. 
three weeks later stands for re-election, the special election, to fill his seat. Um, and wins unanimously from Edgefield, and two weeks after that takes the oath back in Congress. So he's back in after the re-election. But, but these debates, I'll tell you, these debates during the expulsion hearings between North and South are fascinating. It was more than about the Caney. It was about the whole issue of slavery, the whole issue of North and South. You know, it was, it was these great kind of back and forth. So, yeah, yeah, great question. What else? Don't be shy, you guys. Yes. Approximately how long did it take you from the beginning of your research to the point where you were bringing your book for first reading it? Published? Yeah, so how long did it take from the beginning of the research? So I will tell you this. It, it, I'll tell you, it was about three years, three and a half years, but this caning story has been sort of in my head <clears throat> for a long time. I've, I've written two books. I wrote The Boston Italians, I wrote A City right. So Grand, while I had the caning in my head. You know what I mean? Because um, I just, I was fascinated by this whole episode, you know, how did we get to this point, you know, where a United States Senator is beaten on the floor by a congressman. So I just had it banging around there for a while. But I mean, when you talk about just getting down to it, the research and the writing, it's probably three, three and a half years. Yeah. That's a Thank you for the question. Of time. Yeah, I think so. But, it, <laughs> but I think it shows. You know, I think, the, I think you'll see in the book that it, it moves, the story moves well, and it's kind of a dual biography. I'm, I'm really proud of the, there hasn't really been a major Sumner biography since David Donald did his great masterpiece in the 60s and 70s. And um, there's really never been anything about Brooks. I mean, there's, Brooks is mainly a cliche in, in kind of history books as the bully Brooks or the assassin. So um, it was kind of neat bringing him out as a character. Yeah, he's a, he's a footnote. He really is. Yeah. So, yeah. I have two questions. First sure. of all, you mentioned John C. Fremont, who was in the city, right? <coughs> yeah. He was a southerner from South Carolina originally. Now, he, he was all over the place. He was a Only, mainly a unionist. Unionist, he California a, guy. Yeah. He was, yeah. A, he was a Republican? He was, yeah. Yeah, and said there were northern votes that were against him. New Jersey voted against him. Um, I want to say Vermont might have voted against. You know, it was, I think four southern, uh, four northern states he loses. Right, the yeah. Question: Did yeah. California come into the union? They come in in 1850. 50. Yeah, in 1850, I think right right after the, uh, not long after, the Fugitive Slave Law. Yeah, yeah. No, they get populated so quickly. That's what enables them to to come in. So it's the gold rush that leads to the fugitive slave law. You know, you never would say, you'd be like, what? I don't get it. But yeah, it's kind of interesting on how that goes. Yes, sir. Yeah. I forget the name of the person, but the person who, who killed the five people, and then he comes John back. Brown. Oh, okay. Yeah, John yes, Brown. John Brown. comes back, raises money, then goes down. Towards, so all this time, I mean, how does one... It seems like that would be a serious crime. He's literally on the lam this, at this time. I mean, he's pretty much in a lawless place, right, Kansas. So he kind of hides out among the anti-slavery folks. Uh, you know, they have, their, they have their camps. And then he makes his way east. It's kind of a long odyssey, but he makes his way east eventually when he has this notion to raid the, the federal arsenal. He wants to spark a slave insurrection. That's his goal. Um, and so, yeah, he's literally kind of on the lam for that whole time. You, that's exactly right. Yes, sir. This is a little bit of a side. John Brown, he was in Springfield for a while. And I think he got this idea about the Arsenal from the, uh, the Shays Rebellion. Didn't that try to take this? See, I think the Shays Rebellion does influence him, but I think he's kind of, he kind of had this plot. There's a couple good biographies on John Brown. One came out maybe two years ago where he's kind of hatching this plot for a while. You know, like how could he make the biggest difference and sort of strike at the southern slave power, and then he has this idea that raiding a federal arsenal to get enough weapons to put in the hands of slaves would be the way, you know, would be the way to go about it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, th he's just such a wild guy. Because I think Harpers Ferry was the only southern arsenal. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. I think you're right. It's a good one. Yeah? Is, would you say that Webster's intentions were basically honorable? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think... You guys heard that, right? Was West, Webster's intentional, honorable? Yeah. He, he, Daniel Webster was a very strong union man, wanted to preserve the union, no question about it. I do think his intentions were honorable, but it's just one of these whoops, you know, these miscalculations that, um, that doesn't work. I, I, I do think, he, I do think him, him 
the fugitive slave law was his way of saying to the South, okay, let's try this. Um, because the other piece of the 1850 compromise was that slaves would no longer be sold in Washington, D.C., bought and sold. They could be held, but not bought and sold because there was some feeling on the North's part that you know we can't have our capital city be a slave trading place. So that's another piece of the Compromise of 1850. So Webster says, okay, well, all right, the fugitive slave law, that, then let's give the South that. You know, they're, they're losing California, they're losing that, let's give them the fugitive slave law. So. Well, in a sense, wasn't Lincoln the same way that he wanted to preserve the Union? It re really wasn't that anti-slave. Absolutely. So at the beginning of, I would say at the beginning of his uh, uh, presidency even, I mean, well into his political career, but even at the beginning of his presidency, you'll recall Abraham Lincoln met with um, southern slave owners and discussed the possibility of giving them $400 for each head of slave they owned. And with that money, so the South would in turn contribute a little bit toward a fund that would ship blacks back to either the West Indies, Africa, etc. It was a huge discussion. Uh, Lincoln's idea was $400 a head, $400 a head basically, because the South was very concerned. The South's big issue was this notion of uncompensated abolition. You know, what do you mean? What do you mean you're not going to pay us for this? It's like, it would be like me coming and taking your house. You know, that was the, that's the view that they held. Uh, and so then Lincoln begins to evolve, though. He evolves fairly quickly, I think, once he's in office. Um, you know, by the time he issues the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st of 63, you know, he's fully engaged in this anti-slavery. He believes those two things are linked, preserving the Union and ending slavery are linked. But it, takes, it does take him a while to get there, no question about it. I think you're right. I thought I saw him. I don't want to forget anybody in the back, so I want to make sure I get you all. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.